Sponsor support enables Commerce Lexington to host events and keep our members informed of, about important policy issues. And now I'd like to recognize Nick Rowe, President of Kentucky American Water, for, presenting re for his presenting sponsor remarks. Nick. Thanks, Bob. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining. Thanks, thank you in advance for this panel on a very important conversation around uh, COVID. I want to thank uh, the other sponsors who were recognized on the screen earlier, and we continue our partnership with Commerce Lexington. You know, this month uh, uh, meeting, I like to do something a little bit different to celebrate Black History Month. Uh, we start every meeting at Kentucky American and across American Water Enterprise with two things. We start with a safety moment, followed by inclusion and diversity moment. Now, why do we do that? Because we are in a, such a very divisive time in our country right now. We really are. And we think it's very important for our employees to understand uh, other folks' views during this challenging time. And with that, uh, it makes us uh, better employees. It makes us stronger in our communities. It makes our neighborhoods better. It makes our churches better. And what better way than I'd like to talk a little bit about, real quickly, about Dr. King. Uh, you know, Dr. King, uh, wrote his own eulogy, if you don't know that. And he did that because he knew he was going to be assassinated. And when you think about our careers and our lives, you know, I always say at the end, people don't remember your, your title. They don't remember what office you held. They remember your character and how you treated them. And servant leadership is, a, is, is a, at the front of that. And he was an ultimate servant leader. But let me read you real quickly his eulogy. He said, tell them at the end, not to mention I have the Nobel Peace Prize. He said, that's not important. He said, tell them not to mention I have three or 400 other awards. That's not important. Don't tell them where I went to school. That's not important, servant leadership. But I would like for someone to mention that day that Martin Luther King tried to give his life serving others, servant leadership. I'd like for somebody to say on that day that Martin Luther King tried to love somebody so much needed today in these trying times. I want them to say on that day, I tried to be right on the war question, on whether or not to go to war. I want you to be able to say on that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say on that day I tried in my life to clothe the naked. I want you to say on that day that I tried my life to visit those who were in prison. And lastly, I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity servant leadership. He was an ultimate servant leader. And we have an opportunity to do the same uh, in our community. And I think it's so important uh, right now during the advice of time in our countries. And I'll leave you with his last quote, a famous quote I, 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 from Dr. King. And this is so true for us in our neighborhoods and our leadership roles. In the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Think about that. In the end, People won't remember our titles or anything. We will not remember the words of our enemies, but we will remember the silence of our friends. So in Black History Month, in a time of diversity and inclusion, divisive time in this country, friends have to step in the gap. So that's uh, my inclusion and diversity moment for our group this morning. And good luck, panel, on the COVID discussion. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Nick. And what a great way to start your meetings and uh, very enlightening, but also great leadership. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We have an expert panel of local and state leaders with us today to provide the latest update on the vaccine distribution process. We have with us Lexington Mayor Linda Gordon. Good to see you, Mayor. Mark Carter, Executive Advisor, Kentucky Cabinet for Health and Family Services. Welcome, Mark. Dr. Mark Newman, Executive Vice President of Health Affairs, UK Healthcare. Hey, Mark. And someone we get to talk with a lot who's been extremely helpful for us has been Dr. Craig Humball, Director, Lexington Fayette County Health Department. To all of you, thank you uh, very much. So here's how we're gonna try to proceed forward. I will recognize each panelist for five to 10 minutes of opening remarks. And then after that, um, I'll ask some questions uh, of the panel based on questions we've received from our members um, leading up to this event. So let's begin with Lexington Mayor Linda Gordon. And uh, what we had asked her to uh, touch on was provide an overview of the work uh, of the Vaccine Task Force, Distribution Sites, Communications in Lexington, 
And mayor, when you're mayor, you get to kind of touch on anything you want to. So uh, we're glad to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Bob. And I want to thank Nick for his diversity moment. That was really wonderful. Uh, thank you for having me. And just to jump right in it, and I have a few remarks that don't have to do with my task force. So thank you for the, uh, you know, the breadth. So we will all remember that on March 8th, 2020, almost a year ago, Lexington recorded its first official case of COVID-19. And um, we had started working on this earlier, forming our COVID-19 stakeholder groups. And we did that in February because I felt it was important for people who were in leadership positions throughout our community to share what they had been doing to prepare for the pandemic. And so this forming the first of our partnerships, these collaborative efforts uh, that have gotten us through the pandemic was critical. Uh, from those early days until now, business has been a very important part of those partnerships. And Bob, it seems like a long time ago, but you will remember that over 130 businesses worked with us on our reopening plan. And business is such a vital part of our vaccine task force also, and is part of our Let's Do This public awareness campaign, helping us convince our citizens to get the vaccine when it's their turn. And I want to just uh, hold up the co-chairs of our vaccine task force, that is Dr. Craig Humball and Chuck Mix, who have uh, co-chaired this effort. The, the thinking was I needed a, a medical professional, but I also needed someone from the business community who knew about logistics, who knew about executive leadership and those kinds of things to move the task force forward. And within the task force, we have quite a few folks from the business community serving. And one of the areas is the um, campaign that I mentioned, Let's Do This. And I just wanted to quickly mention that the CDC has picked up on Let's Do This and is now highlighting our efforts to inform our citizens, which is a pretty big deal. So our common goal is to, reopening, is to reopen the economy, and we've made some progress, and I want to tell you a little bit about what we've done. In April 2020, our unemployment rate was 14.1%. It was That's April 2020. By December 2020, it had dropped to 4.5%. There's still more work to do, and today I'm announcing our latest initiative with businesses. I have sent an email to council members about this, and I'm going to take a proposed ordinance to council tomorrow to let businesses deduct their expenses paid with the PPP or Payroll Protection Program COVID relief funds. This is a big deal. The average PPP loan is a little over $100,000. That's the average, which means the average business will save about $2,500 in local taxes by us doing this. This step is in line with action already taken at the national level, and it's under consideration at the state level, and it's the right thing to do for our businesses. Also this week, we are working to extend our outdoor seating program to protect our restaurants again. This program started last May when we allowed Lexington restaurants to expand onto sidewalks, into parking lots, and into closed streets to help them survive through the COVID restrictions. And right now, as you know, COVID restrictions on restaurants allow them to use only 50% of their indoor seating capacity. So spring and summer are coming. We have warm temperatures just around the corner. And my feeling is we need to extend this program to help businesses. 
We waived the liquor license renewal fees to help hard hit restaurants. And as everybody here knows, we have one of the most exciting culinary scenes in the country. And we're all anxious for our restaurants to survive through this pandemic. Last summer, which seems like ages ago, we spent two and a half million dollars for a grant program for small businesses and really appreciated Commerce Lexington help us manage that program. So I thank them. It concentrated on businesses owned by minorities and women. And it was a lifeline for many of our businesses. We were able to help 168 businesses with an average of seven employees. So throughout this entire time, our focus has been on business and what we could do to help businesses. And now our businesses are helping us with the vaccine task force and helping people understand that when it's their turn, we want them to get this vaccine. So I will um, end with that. You know, Bob, I could talk a lot longer, but I think I won't. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Oh, thank you. And uh, you mentioned so many different things. Uh, you brought back some old memories, the task force, <laughs> and yes, 130 business and community leaders, pastors, mm -hmm. they're stepped up, stepped out, and um, helped uh, to build that plan going forward. And then also all the way to the $2.5 million in grants. That was a lifeline, like you said. Yes. But now for the announcement of the PPP, that's a huge issue out there. And you're going to help those who are most affected. And so anyway, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next individual we have is Mark Carter. He's executive advisor for the cabinet for health and family services. And he's going to provide an overview of the state's response to vaccine distribution, specifically how it impacts central Kentucky. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Okay, thanks for having me. I'm sorry, uh, I guess I bring greetings from uh, former Mayor Gray. I'm standing in for him and uh, uh, hopefully you won't think you got the second team. I like to think that maybe I'm the sixth man. So uh, uh, let me, I just have a few slides and a few remarks and I'll, I'll go through those uh, quickly. And uh, just from the uh, state perspective around the uh, vaccine effort. Uh, Eric, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, this is just a quick summary. Uh, we have, and these I think are the latest uh, figures over the weekend. We have over 575,000 uh, unique persons vaccinated in Kentuckians, so Kentuckians. Uh, prior to last week, obviously last week was a bit of a disaster because of the weather, but prior to last week, uh, over 100% or 100% of first doses were administered uh, that we received from the feds uh, within seven days of, of receipt. Um, it's a, it's, I should probably defer this to Dr. Newman or Do Dr. Humball, but uh, to think that 11 months ago, we saw our first case of COVID and 11 months later, we have a vaccines with this kind of effectiveness uh, is, has to be a modern uh, medical miracle. And uh, so, you know, we're in a, good place compared to where we were today, but we still have quite a bit of road to travel. So if we could go to the next uh, slide. I have really three points. Um, the vaccine supply continues to be limited. That's improving every week, but it's still in a, in a uh, sort of a condition of scarcity. Um, we're, we have a plan to have both uh, regional mass vaccination sites as well as a robust local distribution uh, system. And then we're, uh, we're looking forward. There was some conversation just before we got started around uh, right now, there's tremendous demand for the vaccine and people are frustrated that they're not able to get appointments. Uh, but probably in the coming weeks, that's gonna start to pivot uh, to where uh, folks that have barriers to receiving the vaccine are gonna become more prominent and we're going to have to reach those people. So the third, the third point is that we're planning for that uh, so that we're ready when, uh, when we have to make that pivot. If we could go to the uh, next slide, please. Uh, just a few, few comments. I think uh, probably most of the audience uh, is aware of some of the challenges with these vaccines, but uh, essentially we have two vaccines, uh, both of which require two doses. Uh, one 
Uh, it requires a three-week waiting period between uh, the first and second dose and the other a four-week uh, period. Uh, one comes in minimum quantities of 100 doses. Another one comes in uh, minimum quantities now of uh, 1,170 doses. And that's the Pfizer vaccine, of course. And that's a recent development, by the way. It was 975 doses just a week or so ago. Uh, and, you know, in terms of that dosage, you can't order less than that. So sites that accept uh, doses and do vaccinations have to be able to handle at least those volumes. Uh, they both have cold transfer and storage requirements, and uh, one requires a special freezer. And uh, you, you have to be very careful with the handling of the vaccines. You can't shake them or disturb them, uh, and you have to use them within a short window or uh, they become ineffective. So there are some real, uh, real challenges with using the vaccines. Um, it's pretty amazing that uh, in our state anyway, so far, uh, we've had very few issues uh, with handling or with the uh, second dose coordination. We have had a couple, but they've been fairly minor and isolated in, in, uh, in Kentucky. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Erica. So uh, what I wanna show you is the progress that we've made over the uh, last few weeks, even with all those complexities, we have been working very hard to build out our very robust distribution network. And let me just show you a, a few slides to illustrate that. This is uh, what existed as of February 1st. And um, I think in terms of most of those sites uh, are hospitals. Uh, you can see the uh, blue sites were the initial hospitals that we worked with. And um, of course, the University of Kentucky has been a, a critical partner in the Lexington, uh, Central Kentucky area uh, from day one. And um, so that's what existed February 1st. The uh, next week, uh, we added additional regional sites. So we added the, um, uh, the green uh, dots that you see there and uh, down in Warren County, down in Murray, up in Northern Kentucky. Uh, so you can see as that's, that's building out. The next week we made even more progress. So if we could go to that. Uh, here we decided to um, uh, basically to supply every local health department at a minimum level across the state. Um, you may or may not know this, but there are 61 health departments in the state, uh, even though there are 120 counties. And uh, the way that is reconciled is that we have a number of uh, district health departments that cover multiple counties. So when you look at this map, while all the counties don't have pins in them, if you look down, say in Pulaski County, uh, where they have, a, I think, a 10 county district there, um, that pin in Pulaski County actually has dosage uh, to account for the other counties in, in that region. So if you're in Clinton or Cumberland County, uh, there were doses allocated to that Lake Cumberland district to account for the population in those counties. So we're starting to build out pretty well here. Um, let's go to the next slide, Erica. Uh, the other, uh, the, uh, an interesting thing here is that uh, we have had uh, some coordination with the federal government. The federal government and the CDC have rolled out uh, two federal programs. Uh, one was to supply pharmacies. Uh, and in this case, uh, the pharmacies were Walgreens and uh, independent pharmacies that were uh, sourced by Amerisource Bergen. And so the, uh, the black dots that you see there are those federal sites that came on, on board uh, during that week and uh, began providing vaccine. And then the um, next slide, uh, again, just continuing to build out. Uh, now we're adding uh, federally qualified health centers, more pharmacies, uh, adding Kroger, Walmart uh, sites across the Commonwealth. So ultimately a, a pretty robust retail distribution system supplemented with some higher volume sites in hospitals and uh, regional centers like the Horse Park or Broadbent Arena over in Louisville uh, and the like. So um, we're, we're continuing to work on that and, um, and we'll keep, keep building out each week as we get more volume. Uh, but I think that uh, you know over a month's time, uh, you can see that that distribution system's built out pretty well. So now we just need to keep getting more vaccine. 
So if we could go to the next slide, please. I said we're ramping up for increased supply. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, you'll see the phases. Um, tough to nail down specific dates, but I think uh, it's been in, in the news sufficiently that uh, we're probably going to 1C uh, next Monday, uh, March 1st. Uh, as you all know, the, uh, the entire state is not the same. And so in some uh, cases, we have sites that have already transitioned to 1C, and that's okay. It's because the, uh, uh, the 1B group was largely getting vaccinated in those locations, and so it was okay to move on to 1C. But uh, by next Monday, we'll be 1C uh, statewide. So um, when we go to phase, uh, phase two is uh, hard to predict. It's a function of how much vaccine we get, what the take up is, and, uh, and the like, but we think that, uh, you know, knock on wood, that the supply of vaccine is gonna continue to increase uh, each week. And so we're hopeful that we can beat some of these uh, timelines in terms of getting Kentuckians vaccinated. And then I will just conclude with um, one more slide. This is just where you can find uh, information about the vaccination effort. We have the um, vaccine.ky.gov site, which is specific for vaccination, uh, but that can be accessed from the kycovid19.ky.gov site. Uh, we also have a call center recognizing that um, not everyone has internet access in the Commonwealth, uh, unfortunately, it's something we need to work on. But uh, we do have call center set up. And then of course the uh, governor's office has a very active um, uh, social media and uh, media relations uh, uh, site as well. And so any of those, uh, any of those uh, channels are open for communication. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and defer to the next speaker. Excellent, Mark. Thank you very much. And uh, wow, that map, those dots kept spreading out. And uh, as we reach out to get to all of our citizens, impressive. Thank you. Dr. Mark Newman, he's Executive Vice President of Health Affairs, UK Healthcare. He's gonna provide an overview of UK's role in vaccine distribution and how this process is going. Thank you, Bob. I couldn't take the uh, opportunity not to advertise a little bit uh, about uh, uh, our academic health center. I'm very proud of it. Uh, and you see the value. When you move to a time like this, you really see the value of an academic health center and being able to step up. A lot of people may not know, but we're the number one transfer center in the country. We take more transfers from other hospitals than any other academic health center or any other center in the country. So we're very proud of that. And that, I think, has set us up to be, you know, to be strong as far as being part of the COVID. And you can see here, interestingly, in the center of the slide, you see we've taken COVID patients to treat here at UK from 105 of 120 counties throughout the state. And I think that's, a, that's that resource we want to be. You can see we've had a number, almost six, now gone over 1,600 inpatients. And we can see overall, we're still, we're down to a nice smaller number now. We have 36 inpatients. We have 22 inpatients who are still here. They're no longer COVID positive, but we're still treating them because this disease is significant. You know, and some of these patients may be in the hospital for months over time. So we're you know, we're very appreciative of the support. And I will say to the point that, uh, you know, uh, you know, we, we just was just made, we agreed to be a regional vaccination center as we grew in that capability. And, and, and because we were able to get vaccines in arms, we got more vaccine to be able to get. And that was a key thing that we wanted to be able to do. And we wanted to be able to be a resource. And I'm going to pass this slide because it's already been talked about. But I will say, you know, when we put up our website to begin doing this, we had 50,000 people sign up within two days. And you see the, so I think you do see the demand. We've worked hard with the, both the Fayette County schools and teachers in general. We vaccinated again, given more than 12,000 vaccinations now and with teachers, but it's a, it's a good process because it takes us about 180 volunteers a day. And I'll, I'll reiterate that. And we don't, we don't charge for the administration. And this is done by volunteers from UK Healthcare and from UK. And so we're, we're proud of that. If you look at it, we're, we're ramping up to more than 4,000 doses a day. And, and again, it's just a commitment by our people. And to, to, this is service. And I will say, if you want to 
we would probably now can take more uh, take more volunteers. So if individuals want to come and volunteer, we can go outside of UK and UK Healthcare now and have the big numbers. And I would say it doesn't matter where you get vaccinated. We're, we're proud of what we've done, but anything we can do to help and facilitate that, it's great. You can see we've gone over 70,000 total vaccines, more than 50,000 unique as of today. So we're, again, and we're, we'll help and work with you in any way we can to be able to do that. I just reiterate, no matter what, get vaccinated. You know, about if we look at our look at our staff here, we've been really proud of our staff. 92% of the staff at UK Healthcare, the 12,000 people that we have have gotten vaccinated. And I think that just, show, again, it's just an important commitment that we want to bring, bring forward. And if, uh, again, we can continue to help, that's what we want to do. So I'm going to stop talking and, and turn it over to Dr. Humbaugh. Well, and you heard me say a little bit earlier, Dr. Humball, that we really appreciate your timeliness. You've informed our board periodically, as has the mayor on COVID-19 and where we're at, where we're going, and the raw, raw, we're going to beat this thing and quicker than people think. I don't know if you said that part. I think we said that part, but it was a great team effort. Let's put it that way. But uh, Dr. Craig Humball is the director of the Lexington Fed County Health Department. He's going to provide an overview of the local health department's role with vaccine distribution, uh, talking about uh, helping with the underserved populations and uh, provide a brief update on the vaccine spread in Lexington. Dr. Humboldt. Hey, thanks a lot. Good to be with you all. Um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, pretty amazing that as the mayor said, we're approaching the one year anniversary of the first case here in Lexington. Um, thanks for all your help. Uh, businesses have been wonderful, been pulled together. I think we've all pulled together as a community to try to beat the pandemic um, during this year. And that's been businesses, universities, schools, nonprofits, and I'm gonna leave somebody else out, but you name it, um, everybody has done their part. And I think that's really helped us. Um, so my, the bad news is that over that last year, we've had a total of over, 31,700 residents have been recognized as having COVID and we've had 230 deaths in Lexington residents have been attributed to COVID. Um, the percentage of deaths has actually remained about the same, uh, but as cases go up, deaths has, have, have risen as well. Um, the good news is that we've seen, like the rest of the state, a steady decline in the numbers of cases each week for the past six weeks and that's following a post-holiday high. So first couple of weeks in January, we had the highest numbers, almost highest numbers ever. We were getting 350-400 cases a week. Now we're down to just under 100 cases a week, which seems, uh, you know, which is still not good, but comparatively uh, seems uh, much better. Um, hospitalizations are also down um, and I'm, we're looking at just Lexington residents. We realize that the hospitals here in Lexington are, are hubs and they're regional centers and they serve the entire central and um, eastern Kentucky region. But um, when we look at hospitalized Lexington residents, we see that uh, that number is down and almost half of what it was, um, for instance, in December. So that's good news too. And it's probably likely due somewhat to the fact that vaccines were prioritized to the long-term care population. And about three quarter of the residents there and 40% of the staff chose to get vaccinated early on in the process. So that's been great. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic has highlighted existing healthcare disparities or health disparities here in in our city uh, among populations in Lexington. Blacks and Hispanics are twice as likely to be hospitalized um, with COVID-19. Uh, blacks are more likely to die as a result of in being infected with COVID-19. Um, certainly elderly populations have taken the brunt of severe disease. 85% um, of our total deaths um, here in Lexington are in those 65 and older and almost half of the total number of hospitalizations um, since the pandemic began are also in this group of 65 and older. So 
there are certain area, certain people who are certainly disadvantaged by, by having COVID. Um, hopefully you've seen over the past year um, the value that the local health departments are bringing um, to the pandemic response. We just have about 160 very hardworking regular staff here at the Lexington Fayette County Health Department. Um, we've been busy sharing data, encouraging folks to take the right public health measures such as mask wearing, physical distancing and hand washing, doing case investigation and um, case isolation, and now of course vaccinations. So uh, vaccinations are of course another tool that we have, our newest tool in the fight against COVID-19. Um, and thanks to UK and Baptist Health and the Horse Park site and many others here um, in Lexington, there have been over 120 vaccine, COVID vaccinations that have been administered in Lexington alone uh, since mid-December. That's quite a number. When you look at um, Mark Carter's numbers, you'll see that that's what like 20% mark of your numbers maybe um, that have just been administered here at Lexington site. So we should be very proud of ourselves. Um, about 70,000 have gone to Lex of those doses have gone to Lexington residents. Remember, we're a hub for this central Kentucky. So a lot of the folks that we saw in the early phase 1A were healthcare workers. And many of those may not necessarily live in this community, but they work in this community and it's important to get them vaccinated as well. Um, as you all know, um, we've had a uh, phased rollout and the first uh, vaccine went to healthcare workers in long-term care facilities. This, this uh, current phase that we're in called 1B uh, has uh, encompassed our K through 12 staff, um, first responders, and that is uh, folks or first responders who weren't healthcare workers. So a lot of those are our law enforcement folks, uh, folks that work in jails, for instance. Um, and then um, we also um, are doing the 70 plus population. So 70 and older, as we said, they're more vulnerable to having uh, severe illness. Um, we estimate that about 15,000 70 and older Lexington residents have been vaccinated with at least one. So we think we're about halfway through getting everybody in that population done if they all wanted to be vaccinated because about 10% or 33,000 Lexington residents are 70 and older. And then most recently, the governor added uh, child care workers to that. Um, and that will be a challenge for us getting those folks in. Um, most of them have to work during the day, Monday through Friday, when many of us are operating vaccination clinics. Um, so, uh, so there's a lot going on in terms of vaccine. Here at the health department, we've administered 15,000 doses. Um, and I think our role as we move forward um, is not going to be so much mass vaccination like uh, the things that Horse Park and UK can do well, but to get involved in the mayor's uh, Let's Do This campaign and to try to reach hard to uh, reach communities with information that they need, inform them, encourage them to be vaccinated, and then try to find accessible ways for them, you know, access to them to get vaccinated. So for instance, we've been working in the last few weeks with the over 70 group, um, working with the senior center and with the mayor's uh, emergency management department um, to help uh, seniors who are not as comfortable with our online registration process. So, you know, like UK, we have an online registration process here to be vaccinated at the health department, but, you know, some seniors may not have access to that or they don't feel as comfortable. Um, and there's also mobility issues. So, and we found this out, you know, early on. So, you know, when we were vaccinating that healthy healthcare workers population, we could really move people through and we could do 2000 a day in our clinics. Um, but when we've got a group of folks with mobility issues who are a little bit slower, we just, our throughput is not as, you know, we, we have to slow it down a bit. So 
Uh, we understand that it's important to get these folks vaccinated because they are at the highest risk. Um, I'll just uh, finish up by reminding folks that there's a couple places you can go for resources. Uh, first of all, I'll mention our website, which is lfchd.org. That stands for Lexington Fayette County Health Department. Org. We have updated numbers every day, not only numbers of COVID um, cases here in Lexington, but also and graphs and interesting information. But we also have um, guidance for businesses and we have now information about vaccination. And then I'll also refer you to um, the city's, uh, since the mayor's on here, the city's website, which is a really good resource, lexingtonky.gov slash vaccines, and that also has really a list of places where people can, um, can uh, look at and try to uh, seek vaccination. So, um, you know, get on lists if they're not necessarily in the group that's being vaccinated. If they are in the group that's being vaccinated, then they can um, to, to seek vaccination there. So uh, I, I would say to folks, the challenge, as you've heard, is that um, you know, we don't have as much vaccine as we'd like, so we want people to be patient, but when it's their turn to be vaccinated, we expect them to step up to the plate and get vaccinated. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Dr. Humbaugh. Now we've got uh, some questions that have been coming in that I would like to ask you all, and, and I'm not sure exactly who might be the, the best person, so step forward if you might have information to guide us on this. Uh, first question, and we're starting to hear a lot of this, uh, will there be options for employers to vaccinate employees on site through the local health department? So, you know, I think of our manufacturers who have a lot of employees or actually any business of any size, and they're trying to minimize. Yeah, I wish we did have that. Um, I'll answer that since I'm at the local health department. I think with our 160 folks and trying to get um, hard to reach populations done, which is going to be our niche. I think that's going to be difficult for us to do. And of course, at this point, we just are challenged with the sheer um, getting enough vaccine to be able to do large manufacturers. Um, but I think it's something that the vaccine task force has talked about. Um, it's just that I, I don't know how at this point, it certainly it's not a reality or a possibility because of those two barriers. But um, you know, we'll have to see in the future uh, whether that's something that could happen or we could partner with, you know, other places in the uh, other providers. There are many other providers in the community that have been um, approved to give vaccine. It's just there's not as enough vaccine to be able to be sent to them. And as you heard uh, from Mark Carter's talk, um, the Pfizer product, you have to deal in large volumes like UK does because you've got to receive, get more than being will to, willing to receive more than a thousand doses every pop. So the newer, the newer vaccines coming down the road, like J and J will be a little easier to manage. And as they get there and we have lots more vaccine then I think that kind of opportunity may present itself. But until then we're just so, you know, we're just so focused on making sure we don't waste any doses. Yeah. And of course, the efficiency of these clinics is much faster than going to. So that's the other thing to consider right now when our, when our main goal is, as Dr. Newman said, getting vaccines in arms as fast as we can. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, the uh, Transylvania University President Brian Lewis, is there any discussion underway about vaccinating college students earlier than fall winter, given they tend to live in close proximity with each other, uh, either on campus or in off campus accommodations? Good question. Right now, there isn't a discussion. They're not in one of the higher phases. Uh, we understand that. Uh, we also need to. Um, we need to look at what the vaccine, uh, the current vaccine products that we're using are approved for. One is approved for age 16 and older. The other is approved for 18 and older. So we're getting down into that age group too, where we have to be concerned about is the vaccine approved for these folks. Um, I do think it will, 
it will happen, but at this point, um, our focus is on these 1B and 1, and yeah, as you heard Mark Carter say, soon the 1C population. It's just a, uh, it's a risk-based approach, so prioritizing the riskier groups that uh, are going to be more, more prone to get the infection and spread it. So um, that's, that's the reason for the priority, and all these things get solved by more vaccine and, uh, and the extension of the vaccine to younger people. Well, and I want to mention too that we've had a great working relationship with Transylvania since he asked the question from the very beginning. We've talked with them each week. They've done everything we've asked them to do and more. And like UK, they've had their own system of helping us determine who's a close contact on campus and getting those people in isolation quickly. Well, Brian, since joining Transylvania University, he has hit the ground running, and he's just been tremendous, tremendous asset in our community, as his Transylvania voice has been. Hey, uh, Mark Carter, um, kind of touching on something that you just mentioned, um, is the state considering any changes to the categories for, for distribution? The, the Biden administration has seemed to signal there may be movement to do away with categories. Well, we're following we're following the CDC's uh, guidelines around categories, and um, we we watch them every day and talk to the CDC every day. Um, you know, things evolve and change, and I think um, you know if there is a change to move away from phases, and that's a national guideline, I think that we'll have to seriously consider doing that. Um, it, it's it's been inter an interesting process, and I I started working with Dr. Humbaugh and contact tracing now almost a year ago. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, this was a virus that didn't exist um, a year ago. And so how we've approached it has had to evolve and, and change as we moved along. And that's probably going to be the case with the vaccination effort also. I will and, say too, when we get to 1C, that's going to be a huge population, if you think yeah. about it. I mean, yeah. greater than 60 or anybody necessarily older than 40 with those comorbidities, that's gonna be a huge. So we're gonna spread out into a very big population. So the idea of two or three down there below is gonna be on down the line a good ways. And I think that, so ask your people to go ahead and sign up, ask them to get in the queue, but, but it may be a long queue. Yeah, Dr. Newman, that's a very good point. And you know, before um, we went live, we were talking uh, there's just so many different comments and uh, different sources of information and, you know, questions about, you know, with the new Biden administration, you know, just, well, thanks, Jane, here and there. So I'm glad we're able to kind of address some of these issues because they are percolating out there and, and people are curious. Um, how long do you estimate it will take to achieve herd immunity in Lexington? When should employers plan to bring back employees to offices? should work from home continue until the end of 2022, if not an essential business. How's that for, a, unpack that one for us. I like the way that you started that out. It lets me defer to one of the clinicians. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I don't know if Dr. Newman wants to chime in on this, but my thought would be from an epidemiology standpoint that we don't yet know what level um, of vaccination we need to reach what I like to call community immunity. Um, so how many people do we need or what percentage of the population do we need to get vaccinated in order to start interrupting um, permanently the spread of disease? Because in order for this disease to propagate, each person who has it has to spread it to one other person, right? Otherwise, it's going to start to shrink. Um, and that's what we want to, a vaccine to do for us is to provide this immunity so that, you know, if I'm sick, I can't give it to somebody else. So therefore it stops the disease with me. Um, and so we don't know that yet. And some of that may have to do with whether other variants become um, the, the predominant variant here. So we've seen other variants that have surfaced in other parts of the world, not as much here in Kentucky and Lexington right now, but if they're more contagious, then they could take over and become the more common variant. And in those cases, it may take 
a higher percentage of folks to be vaccinated in order for us to reach community immunity. So we wish we had the um, answer for that. We're, I guess the bottom line right now is we're nowhere near that, okay, when we're talking about maybe 15% of the population being um, vaccinated. We've got a long way to go. The other piece, Bob, that makes it complicated is we don't know how long the immunity lasts from an infection, right? And so that's a real issue for us. And this, you know, we talked about the we didn't even have this virus a year ago. So we don't know, is it 90 days is kind of what we've thought about. But and so we're encouraging people who once they have recovered fully from COVID to be on that list to get vaccinated as well. I think that's an important you know, we just don't know for sure. And, and I've talked to some people on the call today about encouraging them to go ahead and, you know, if they've recovered fully to get vaccinated, because we just don't know the time frame of what the immunity is going to be both for the, you know, for the infection. You know, no matter where I go, I run into the question people are asking, you know, when's the chamber going to be back 100% in the office? And I know that in there, um, the question was is raised because they're trying to figure out the same thing. Um, you know, what, what would you tell folks as far as when to bring back employees to the offices? And if you're a non-essential business, um, you know, should you wait until into 2022 or later 2021? I mean, it just, I know it seems kind of a bizarre question, but people really are grappling trying to figure out, figure all that out. I think the guidance right now is to continue to telework if you can telework if that's possible um, to do that. I know that about half of our staff here at the health department um, now teleworks, uh, all the, um, pretty much all of the case investigation, contact tracing, isolation and quarantine is done uh, by teleworkers. Um, really, it's uh, the pandemic has had the effect of really changing how we do business here operationally, and I would assume that's probably true with a lot of businesses in the community, we found that people can effectively do it. And um, so moving forward, when we get to some place that we're in a different environment, maybe this summer, maybe this fall, I think we'll still have a lot of people that will consider um, teleworking for a variety of reasons, not just because of COVID, but also because uh, it may be more con you know, conducive to their lifestyle, um, as long as they can get the work done that we're asking them to do. So um, we're all going to have to look at that as kind of part of a post-COVID normal um, in, in, my, in my thinking. So another question from uh, our uh, participants, what is guidance on getting vaccine for elderly or other high-risk populations who are homebound with limited mobility? Are there any options for at-home vaccinations? Right now, that's a tough one uh, because of the uh, nature of the vaccines and the way they have to be stored. Um, I, can say, I can tell you at the state level, though, that um, we are planning ahead uh, for precisely that. And I, I, believe, um, I believe the university's either doing something already. I'll let Mark talk about that. But... Um, but we are planning ahead for, um, you know, just how do we get to populations or individuals that, um, you know, have barriers in front of them in terms of getting the vaccine. So that could be homebound elderly. It could be folks in uh, socially vulnerable uh, communities. Uh, vaccine hesitancy, skepticism, overcoming that through good communications and outreach. Uh, all those things are on the radar screen, but at the moment, the technical requirements of of the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines make it hard to take it out. Uh, you know, it, they, they both lend themselves more to mass sites or centralized sites. I, I agree. That's the thing we do have. We have added a, as I know that the city has added a call number for those who can't, you know, be on our UKVaccine.org site. And so in some cases, we have had volunteers to be able to, you know, help us pick people up and bring them to the site. It is just not with the complexity of the vaccine and knowing that it has a narrow hour window. It's just not where we can go out to do that. But we have been able to help several uh, individuals that were homebound be able to come to us. And I think that if 
people reach out to the number, we'll, we'll do what we can, just like the city is, just like the other sites are to be able to do that or use some of the drive through, you know, capability as we grow it uh, to try to make it easier on people. Yeah, just one thing I'd add, Bob, uh, that uh, Mark mentioned earlier is that um, once the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is approved and distributed, it does not have the um, complex handling requirements that these two do. So I think that vaccine is going to provide a lot of opportunity to, to you know, take the uh, Wesleyan approach and take it to the people. So, um, <laughs> you know, that, that, is a, uh, that is a positive thing on the horizon. I know one of you also touched on this um, in your comments, but what's the latest research on the variants? Uh, are the variants in Lexington? Should we be double masking? Well, I'll, I'll take the first part. I don't think we've seen the variant yet here in Lexington, but uh, Dr. Humbaugh is a better person to probably ask that. We are doing a study now looking at about, you know, looking at about 100 of our, you know, the positive students that are coming through that are rolling in a study to allow us to look and sequence to see if we see another variant. So far, you know, again, I don't think we've seen it, but again, Dr. Humbaugh is probably the better person to answer. Yeah, Bob, Dr. Newman's right. We're not aware that it's here, but remember when you get tested, that doesn't tell you whether it's a variant strain or not. Just says, hey, you have COVID-19. So um, the uh, actual virus has to be sequenced and there are very few places in the state that are able to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, at this point, we're not aware that, that we're seeing variant activity here. Okay. When we get our first hundred done, we'll put that, we'll put out the information to Dr. Humbaugh and them to be able to look at, but the students represent a good group because they come in, some of them, you know, are being tested on a regular basis and we can, we can look at it. What I would say is that we have had a few cases that we call breakthrough cases has been very few, but folks who um, have, have documented COVID-19 positive test after uh, two weeks after their second dose. And we're following those folks carefully and the folks that are their close contacts if they get sick. And those are the ones that we're interested in sequencing their virus and seeing if, is that a different strain? Is that a strain of concern? Um, that's circulating and is that why they're a quote breakthrough case? No vaccine is 100%, but these vaccines are very close to it, okay? And uh, we have a couple uh, quick questions here to ask as we start to wrap up. What are the best resources for staying informed as more distribution sites come online? Well, the, one of the sites that I mentioned was the uh, vaccines.ky.gov site. <clears throat> that may that's probably the best one for statewide information. Okay. And I think locally the best one is the site I mentioned that's on um, the urban uh, county government's uh, website, which is lexingtonky.gov slash vaccines. Excellent. Um, we have another question from uh, a participant. Is there additional trials underway for approval for children 16 and under? And what's the timeline for children under 16 to get the vaccine? Those trials are finishing. Some of them are finishing right now. And so we should be able to see. I think they went down as young as 12. I believe Dr. Humbaugh was the next. And they will sequence down in order. I mean, and people ask why we do that. But we do it to reduce the, any kind of risk to children. So we go, we do adults first before we do children typically as part of this. So we should know pretty soon with some of this, I believe the Pfizer trial is done and I know the other trials are ramping up, um, you know, but we haven't seen the results yet. I want to say thank you to all of you and mayor, you, you know, as mayor of a community, you have all this talent, all these specialists, all these folks here at your fingertips and quite frankly, how everyone comes together to work together to uh, ensure our, our public safety. To the panelists, you're superb. Uh, Secretary Gray was right on Mark Carter. He said, Mark's much better than I will ever be. So anyway, <laughs> he, uh, uh, he, uh, he spoke highly of you. But anyway, thank you all for taking time. You know, Mayor, in our conversations, I know from time to time, you've talked about how living in a medical Mecca 
is so incredibly important. As a former nurse, you know that firsthand. I can tell you as a former patient, yes, um, uh, yes we do live in a great place. Um, and the other thing is, you've all talked about this, uh, all hands are on deck. And mm -hmm. until we get this thing totally resolved, uh, until we get the answers, till we get the uh, solutions, we're going to stay at it. Um, for all for all of our participants, please, if you have other questions uh, and you're not sure who to contact, contact us and we'll get that question out to the right person. So again, thank you very much. Nick Rowe, Kentucky American Water, thank you, presenting sponsor and all of our other sponsors. And thank you all very much for, uh, for being with us today. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, guys. Thanks for the invitation, Bob and Andy. Appreciate it. Thank you.